Hey geeks, what's up? I did a short on Captain America Essential Volume 1. And uh, figured today I would do sort of a, I don't know, I have no script. I'm going free form. Let's take a look at this. I have some other stuff I want to look at too, but um, I thumbed through a 30 second clip, I think, a few days ago um, of this book. Let's take a closer look at it. You know, what's really cool about these Essential Editions is you can really see the line artwork sans any color. So uh, the majority of, the, majority of this was uh, done by Jack Kirby. This is the issue. This is the first appearance of MODOK. <laughs> There's some really, really good... These are really good comics here, man. This is Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, doing Captain America in the 60s, firing on all cylinders. Um, there was one issue... Let's see if I can find it. This is the Destructor. <laughs> is it Destructo or Destructor? Oh, no, this is the Mecco Assassin. And this is the Mecco Assassin. Yeah. Yeah, the Destructor, um, he shows up later on. Yeah, when he teams up with, uh, with Black Panther to uh, take on... Who, who appears to be Baron Von Nemo, who survived World War II. But then <clears throat> um, it doesn't turn out to be uh, Baron uh, Zemo, not Nemo, Zemo. Turns out, I think, to be Red Skull. But uh, anyway, you've got Cap and Black Panther in action in these issues. And uh, Agent 13, who's undercover. And there's a... Zemo, or someone impersonating Zemo. And let's see here. This issue was interesting because Kirby did the art. I think the inking changed though, because it just it looks it actually looks more like Kirby's older stuff when he was with Joe Simon. The um, the line work is not as angular as it was in, in other issues. So I, I think the inker changed up in this one, or maybe Kirby inked himself. I'm not sure. But it has more of, I don't know, more of a penciled look than typical Kirby art, especially in this run. Still looked gorgeous, though. So yeah, Zemo builds this uh, super ray that, that can destroy the, the Earth, destroy planets and whatnot. So the Panther and uh, Cap are, are sieging his uh, stronghold to shut him down. Um, and Agent 13 was there posing as a, as a uh, spy. She soon found out, though. And then um, starts with Captain America 100, which is really the first issue of Captain America. So, it, it, you know, it, it was Tales of, Tales of Suspense. It had Captain America and uh, Iron Man in it. Um, and then they just went ahead and, and called it Captain America. And uh, Iron Man went and got his own comic book as well. Um, so you got a little bit of an origin story about how the Avengers discover Captain America in a block of ice. We all know the lore. Let's see where that part is. Um, a lot of Kirby battle scenes, of course. Oh yeah, here they're trying to do, they're trying to escape. And uh, yeah, here it is. They're in this uh, in this air ta air hatch or whatever air tube, and um, Zemo's like, the <laughs> "Let them go ahead. They're gonna get they're gonna get caught by the Destructon." And so um, they find the Destructon <laughs> waiting for them. I am the Destructon. It is my function to attack. Any who invade these quarters, and whom I do attack, I do destroy. 
Captain America puts a wall up on him from behind. And you see this, this pose here, this figure pose of the destruct on. Kirby uses that um, more than once, I'm sure. But I think this is this is maybe the first time he kind of drew this sort of splayed out figure. Um, in the Fourth World Saga, if you recall, when they go out to, um, I forget what he calls that area of space, um, where all of the fallen gods are sort of like encased in stone and and. You know, I don't know if he calls it the negative zone or or what what the name of that area is, but it's all these massive gods floating in space, and um, they they have this pose. They're kind of like in this pose because they're sort of like locked into these asteroids. You know, like they're they're basically crucified on them is what it is. Like this, the body is laid out, and they're like shackled with these huge, you know manacles that are the size of planets or whatever so so i just thought that was interesting he uh he falls back on you know like all artists they have their beats and he falls back on this once in a while and it's a very effective um it's a very effective figure and form and this panel so it's just i mean you've got captain america with the swing You've got all of these speed lines or movement lines. And one thing that I um, I recognized looking at this Captain America work, especially in black and white, uh, as I said, it really makes the line work pronounced, absent any color. And Kirby just, he just goes wild with speed lines in just, you know, in all of his panels, really. I mean, you don't have a page without some kind of speed line work. So, um, you know, reminiscent of uh, of manga. Um, <clears throat> and I used to kind of sort of think, you know, like manga is known for those speed lines. Really, all of their artists use them uh, all the time. But I, I guess I was kind of thinking, yeah, you know, manga, you know, that's where the speed line originated. But I'm thinking maybe not. Maybe Kirby was the uh, was the originator. At least at least the use of them so heavy. You know they're just so they're so evident. They're 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 probably even more evident in these books than the Kirby Crackle. Um, you know which we kind of maybe see a little bit of that there. So yeah, so they end up defeating the Destructon. And there's another issue, there's another one I wanted to point out. I think it's this one. With uh, Batroc, or Batroc. The, um, he is the French um, assassin, I guess like super uh, acrobat. He's like a super acrobat killing machine. And uh, Cap has a few battles with him, but there, here it is, yeah. So, you know, he gets into a tussle with him, uh, and I think I think he mistakes, initially he mistakes um, Captain America for the super adaptoid, <laughs> who's, who was mimicking Captain America, and he, uh, he actually defeats the super adaptoid, and then C Captain America, who's passed out, he wakes up, finds Baltrock, and, and he's like, okay, who is this guy? And Baltrock's like, oh, he got up. So he doesn't realize he's now fighting the real Captain America. So the real Captain America proceeds to, to uh, engage in combat. And then you get this, this really awesome page of, of Kirby dynamics, you know, fighting dynamics. And you've got this, uh, this little piece of writing from Stan Lee. The wise man knoweth when to speak and when to shutteth up. Sly Stan knows that no words of his can do justice to Jolly Jack's great action scenes. And so... And then you just go into the panels of the action and there's no no commentary from Stan Lee for once. For once. See what we mean, frantic one? <laughs> so even Stan Lee is like, yeah, okay. Let the master do his thing. I'm going to stand back here and just shut up for a while. Let Jack do his thing. Let Jack be Jack, man. And they did. So very cool. Very cool. 
All right. Um, I actually have these in color in a in a Marvel Omnibus um, Volume One. Let's see here. I pull it off my shelf. And in fact, it goes beyond this essential edition. Yeah, baby. Get a load of that. Now this one goes beyond it because it's got the it's got a lot of the Steranko issues in it too. The Jim Steranko issues. Issues 100 to 113. So this this only goes to issue 103, I think. Of Captain America. So I get like 10 additional issues in color that Sterenko did. In addition to all the stuff we just saw in color. As you can see it's in the shrink wrap. And um, I'm going to titillate you with it. I'm not going to open it now. In fact, we're going to look at some stuff I bought. Surprise, surprise stack of stuff I bought at Second and Charles. Um, I went and bought all the Despicable Me movies. <laughs> and I haven't seen Despicable Me number four yet. It's in the theaters. Um, I saw the first Despicable Me. I didn't see Despicable Me two and three. And uh, I don't know why. I liked the first one, but man, the first one came out like what? Like 15 years ago? Um, but I don't know why I bought these. I just, for some reason, I, uh, I just had a, a hankering to see all of them. Because so I liked the first one, and I've heard the others are very similar to the first one. So, I went out and bought used copies of them on Blu-ray. And then, I've been wanting to see this movie for a while, Apollo 18. There's a reason we've never gone back to the moon. You know, and I have Moon Trap. Uh, with Walter Koenig and um, what's his name from Evil Dead. Um, so maybe I'll do a double feature. But I've heard this is pretty good. I think this has kind of a cult following. It came out, I don't know, probably about 10 years ago. Here's a book about aliens. The world's leading scientists on the search for extraterrestrial life. It has It has to do with this, maybe. <laughs> There's some talk of the James Webb Telescope. Rainbow's End from Werner Vigne, or Werner Vinge. I guess it's Werner Vinge. So I have I actually have not really read any Werner Vinge. And I and I want to. I want I actually wanted to get Fire in the Deep, but they didn't have it, but they did have this. I thought it looked interesting. So, um, so I figured I'd pick it up. Uh, from what I understand, he can't go wrong with Werner Vinge. Yeah, four-time Hugo Award winner. And uh, let's see what some of the blurbs here say. A computational dysutopia that perfectly captures the roaring hilarity of out-of-control technological change. Vinge, Vinge is blazing a new trail toward the singularity, turning cyberpunk paranoia into cracking adventure stories that combine technical rigor and a keen eye for the social impact of technology. So that's right up my alley. And here's a guy, here's an egghead from MIT praising the book as well. What year did this come out? Because I always think of him as kind of an old-timey sci-fi writer, but... And I think he may be, but I think I think he transitioned well into the modern era. Yeah, this came out in 2006, so, you know, not that long ago. Here, look at this. To the internet-based cognitive tools that are changing our lives. Wikipedia, Google, eBay, and the others of their kind now and in the future. <laughs> oh, Werner, I hope you're alive today. I hope you are. I think he is. I wonder what he thinks of uh, generative AI. Superman, City of Tomorrow, Joe Kelly, Jeff Loeb, J.M. DeMattis, and Ed McGinnis, Volume 2. So I need to find Volume 1 so I can read, so I can read all this. Um, as you know from a couple of videos back, I've been kind of on a Superman kick lately. That's kind of paused because I got so much into Cerebus uh, the past five or six weeks. Um, but yeah, I want to... Um, 
I want to read both of these volumes. So I, I need to find volume one. If anyone knows where I can get a used copy of it. William Gibson and Bruce Sterling, The Difference Engine. So another uh, sci-fi kind of cyberpunkish. Oh no, steampunk. In London in 1855, the great steam-driven Babbage engines. I read a really cool book about the Babbage engine um, a couple years ago. I think it was called... What was it called? Oh, I forget. Anyway. Uh, the Babbage engine's power, the Industrial Revolution. The age of the computer is already here, and the industrial radicals and the scientists are its rulers. But there's still treachery and intrigue at the heart of government, and Sybil Gerard, fallen woman, Edward Mallory, paleontologist, and Lady Ada Byron, compulsive gambler and mathematical genius, are unwittingly caught up in a conspiracy that could change the world. So, um, yeah, cool. Also right up my alley. Sounds kind of Neil Stevenish, ish Stevenish, ish ish, -ish. Um, Because I just read System of the World by Neil Stevenson. And that was a similar semi-steampunkish, but not too much. It was really more alternative historical fiction. Solving the Communion Enigma, Whitley Stryber. Um... If you don't know, Whitley Stryber is a very famous UFO contactee or abductee uh, experiencer. I don't know if I believe anything that he says, but I find his uh, books fascinating. He is also a uh, science fiction author and a horror author, which, you know, kind of like you have to ask the question, like how much of what he writes that he supposedly says is fact is actually fiction because he is a trained fiction, you know, um, person. He, he writes fiction. Um, so, you know, one of the um, skills of a fiction writer is uh, that they can write things that appear to be sort of like realistic, you know. So anyway, I haven't read that yet. He's got a number of books out. Uh, Communion was his first big one that he came out with in 1983 or 84. And that kind of kicked off the whole thing with him, with the abduction. I found this interesting book, Cities of the Fantastic, Volume 2, The Invisible Frontier. Um, this had a lot of really cool architecture in it semi-erotic as well <laughs> um but this is yeah this is kind of like a steampunk you know type of um almost maybe let's not even call it steampunk let's call it architecture punk yeah architecture punk that's what we can call it uh in the tradition of kind of like heavy metal illustration you know and it's in one of these large format books you see here like these I haven't read this yet. Uh, this environment is kind of like they're looking at, looking at these maps and sort of this Kafka-esque, you know, interior. You got these machines that are like, I guess, cranking out like these maps and these people that are well-dressed that are like analyzing the output with all these lamps and stuff. Yeah, it's, um, you get sort of these fantastical, you know, you got so large skull, but you've got like these these open decked windows that they're kind of crawling around. It's kind of a cross between Indiana Jones and um, archipunk genre, which I'm just now coining and inventing that term. Copy copyright 2024. Stay geek. <laughs> copyright 2024. Yes, yeah, so, I mean just thumbing through it, you know, it looked interesting to me. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm into this architecture thing. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, I nabbed it. Yeah, it's just, this is pretty cool, too. These sort of, like, surreal, you know, architecture landscapes. Um, in this interior, you know, you get this sort of, like, Similar to what we were looking at with Cerebus, you know, you got this like 16th, 17th century 
European aristocratic, you know, sort of semi baroque interiors, you know, costuming as well. Yeah, it is, it kind of, I mean, it is pretty much kind of steampunk, I guess you could say, you know. So I've never heard of this series, I've never heard of this book. I, I don't, I don't know anything about it. I'd like to find the first volume. I don't know how many volumes are are in it. I'll have to look it up. I haven't really um I haven't really uh, investigated it. All right, so that was one haul. That was one haul. And that was uh that was from a while ago. What else do we want to look at? What do you want to look at? What do you want to see? I got a lot of stuff here. We are in the comic book library room. Oh, I got, I'll pull this off the shelf. This is a good one. I haven't shown this yet. Aqua Atlantic. This is another one of these books that I saw that I thumbed through and I just loved the, the visual style of it, the visual language. Um, this is a beautifully designed and illustrated um, graphic novels published by Fantagraphics. It's got like this really wild, um, I want to say it's almost, is it, it's actually, it's a mixture of styles. I see like cubism in here. I see like Dada. As you can see here, it completely, completely changes for a few pages. Um, you know, the artwork is just like, I don't know what they're laying down here. Like, is, this can't be airbrush. I'm just not as much of an expert at art technique especially when it comes to some of these comics some of the techniques these guys use you know but the i love the the, the color changes in this book almost continuously you know like the design of these creatures you got this giant squid here um you know, this is actually a painting that, the, that these characters are looking at. You've got this architectural design. Just wild stuff, man. Just really creative artwork. The story, um, I barely even remember it. The story did not really stick with me. It, I remember it being just kind of simplistic, actually. It's the uh, it's the artwork though is where your is where your dollar is going here. It's the visual aspect of it. That's where your money's going here. Yeah, it's just it's just a this turtle dude here. It's just a, a beautifully illustrated graphic novel. Also, um, Russian, uh, this has reminded me of Russian, no, not constructivism, but just sort of Russian post-war artwork in general. And yeah, just, yeah, no, uh, no lettering on these two pages. Pretty cool, man. Just wild stuff. Wild stuff. <laughs> so, uh, who's the, uh, Gior Giorgio Carpinteri. Yeah. So, um, oh, it's, okay. So Burns is involved in this too. So, okay. That makes sense. There is some Burns in there. I wonder if he did the inking. He might've done some of the, um, oh yeah. And it says right here, Car Carpent. Carpentieri's sheer graphic brilliance fusing aspects of futurism, cubism, Russian constructivism, and German expressionism. 
with strong echoes of Bauhaus and Art Deco, brings to life this gorgeous allegorical fantasy. Okay, so um, I called Cubism, I called Russian constructivism, but I said it wasn't exactly constructivism. It was more post-war, <laughs> but I was close. German Expressionism, Bauhaus Art Deco. So yeah, it, it is. It's a fusion of all these different art styles. And it's uh, it's it must have taken them a long time to create this work. So anyway, that, I think I got that earlier in the year. What else? What else? What, am, what Let's pull this off my shelf. I might have shown this um, before, but not dug into it. Great American Comic Books by Ron Goulart. Uh, Ron Goulart, or Goulart, is a writer, comic book writer. I remember him for writing a lot of Marvel stuff. He probably did some work with DC, too. I think this is just kind of his historical overview of the history of American comic books. And, um, let me tell you what. Bear with me. I need to... There's a laptop that's in my way. Let's move that. Let's move Captain America. All right. Yeah, this book, these books are so big, I'm, I'm having trouble fitting them into the camera. Let's do a little bit, little bit of an adjustment here. Let's see if we can get a little bit more leverage up here. Bear with me. Nah, it's not too much better, but oh uh, yeah, we kind of got it in there. Okay, so um, yeah, I love this old school stuff, you know, fun comics, more fun comics. This is a big book, man, but I, you know, I guess pretty decent reproductions from a lot of these. Bob Merritt. Oh, the Fu Manchu newspaper strip from the 30s it's from the 30s folks so don't don't freak out new comic sandor and the lost civilization 1937 hmm. owned by dc comics is the copyright now they must have assumed that character at some point adventure comics I mean, comic book people like me, I love to read about comic book history because, you know, I'm sure 95% of the stuff that's in here I haven't seen before. Or if I had, I've, 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 I've only seen like the images. I don't know anything about the backstories. I don't know anything about the histories. I love these old pulp magazine covers. Um, there's some old shadow. Look at that. And then you've got Shadow Comics, so in this, though, you've got Doc Savage, Nick Carter, Iron Monroe. <laughs> that is an awesome name for, for a hero. Who is, I see, I don't know. I've never heard of Iron Monroe. Frank Merriwell. That, for, what is he, Frank Merriwell accountant? I mean, <laughs> it's not like a superhero name, but Iron Monroe, like, you don't want to fuck with this guy. Iron Monroe looks like he'll bash you in the face repeatedly if you cross him nick carter i guess this is the pre-pop star days you know doc savage everybody knows doc savage man come on and then of course the shadow so yeah i'd like to get a copy of this there's probably probably a pdf out there somewhere or it's in a collected book 1940 may of 1940 man wow it's very possible like my father read this or even my grandfather and then you got all these different uh covers black book detective the whisperer the phantom detective yeah the shadow magazine twice a month oh man if you could go back in time man and look at those newsstands that they had back then you know it's no wonder the newsstand was such a huge motif in alan moore's watchmen because it was like this meta function in that story, you know, especially with that pirate, um, that sort of pirate adventure side show that he wrote into that book. And it was pure pulp. 
pure pulp comics within something that was inspired by kind of pulpy Charlton comics. Yeah, Spider. Like, you know, never seen that before. Superman. Doc Savage, man of man of ma mastermind and body. Follow his glorious adventures every month. Superman, but not Superman. But later on, possibly Superman. Maybe that's where they got the, uh, the inspiration for the name. Um, these old Buck, or these old Flash Gordon... Uh, serials, the TV, I, I guess it was, a, no, well, well, it wasn't a TV show back then. TV hadn't been invented, but it was in the movies. Uh, you can see, these, these are on YouTube now, I've noticed. Captain Midnight. He eventually made his way into um, All-Star Comics, DC. Here we go. The original Action Comics with Superman. Chapter 5. Everything changed when Superman came on the scene. Alright, let's see what else we've got here. Gay Funny Comics. Flickers in Love. Hijinks Flea Circus. So some old animal comics. Buzzy. Looks like Pratfall Comics. Rib Tickling Misadventures of America's Favorite Teenster. That's a DC imprint. DC Comics, Andy Hardy, ah, some Basil Wolverton, the Brain Bats of Venus. Nobody draws like Wolverton, man. Nobody draws. I wish he had done more sci-fi stuff. He's known so much for the Mad Magazine stuff he did, but his science fiction stuff is freaky. Freaky deaky. Very cool looking stuff. Captain Midnight and Shazam. Ibis, the Invincible. Never seen that before. Super Snipe, <laughs> issue number 13, Black Owl. Yeah, I was going to say Simon and Kirby. So we've looked at that. We've looked at that. I've got that black and white Simon and Kirby, very early Kirby uh, collector stuff. Prize Comics. I always wanted to get my hands on some of those. I remember seeing these in the Overstreet Price Guides. Well, I wonder how much those are worth these days the black owl in prize comics jackpot comics who's in that steel sterling black hood mr justice and sergeant boyle and see so, you know they're, they're all together in this um in this cover image but they're not a team i believe not in they all have their separate stories and you know i think you know back in the day i mean those books would be like 80 90 pages because each one of these guys would get you know their own full story of comics yeah that's